morning, Waterbury. You know, our governor, our governor of the great state of Connecticut, wanting to give a appropriate and appropriate shout out to the men and women's uh, basketball teams. Remember the words he said? that the state of Connecticut produces champions. That's what he said. Wish to God that I could have just tweaked that a bit. Add it to it. Can you just put Waterbury Church of Christ in there that produces champions? Can you, can you just add that little small line, you know? Because I'm looking into the faces of winners. You're not losers. You're winners. And you are fighting and winning in the championship every day. And the Bible says, the word, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory. In Jesus Christ. Could you stand for me with me in the reading of the word and prayer? We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that, it's a connected phrase, so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, God, Lord God Almighty. Father, we are in need of your power to prevail in this moment, defeat distractions, keep our minds focused on the word that we may learn and live out inspired truth on this all important subject of our fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're speaking about getting our fellowship right. Come on, listen. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three of them wants us to get our fellowship right. That's why you're here this morning. That's why you're sitting in your place and space on the Lord's day because you, you, you agree with God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that I want to get the fellowship right. In our first lesson, we raised the question, who makes up the fellowship that we need to get right? Three, three. God, other believers, and me. That's our fellowship. That's who we connect with. That's who we relate to. That's who we bond our lives. Stake our very salvation on. That I will be saved. I will be in glory if I maintain a togetherness with God 
But don't stop there. Start there. God, other believers, and me. So we move on in this second lesson. We go from who to when. That's vital. When do we engage in the fellowship that we need to get right? Here it is for it to have a consistency of credibility. There is a there is a credibility of fellowship that only comes through consistency. Something about the fellowship loses its credibility when it's not consistent. Oh, I'm not just speaking about in the physical. I'm speaking about in the spiritual. So I want to address in the second lesson, see if we can get through the when and maybe I'm always trying to look at our time to see if we can get through the why. Now, when and where and how often do we fellowship? Let's, we're talking about when. When, where, and how often. That's, that's important for us to raise the question. Christian fellowship is built on the firm foundation. I call it a firm foundation. I call it a place that has to be established. Foundations are things that you can build on and grow on, walk on, do your spiritual business on. Things plummet and fall without a foundation. So Christian fellowship is built on the firm foundation, listen to this now, of understanding the concept of accountable attendance. We're moving into the wind. Accountable attendance. Not it's word, it's Bible, it's in the book, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the matter of some. You probably cannot. Remember the very first time you heard that as a Christian. If you had to give a date to it. But you have heard it more than one time. You've heard it down through the annals and the epochs and the eras and the days of your Christian life. You've heard sermons about this need to have accountable attendance. This verse is one of the verses that's raised. Now, let's go deeper. Let's take a closer look at Hebrews 10, 20. First thing, it speaks directly to a mindset. Follow me. Follow me now. Follow the Spirit. That was becoming, I say, okay with being three words, repetition, to reinforce the truth, disinterested, distant, and detached from up close and personal one another relation. He's addressing that in this text. He's, he's saying that there is a problem, look at two, that needs to be called out without being specific about, read it, come on, why some were abandoning, walking away and being a wall. He doesn't say why. He doesn't name the specific behind the infraction. He just said that there's a problem that needs to be addressed. 
There's an issue that needs to be brought out and put on the table of something that needs to be fixed and resolved and mitigated. He calls it a forsaking. Here's the thing, here's the thing. Uh, I know this and you know this, that the modern day church, that's us, has debated how this verse should be applied. I've, I've been a part of that even in speaking at workshops and seminars down in my years in ministry uh, about this verse. Does it apply to the worship? If it does, does it apply only to the worship? Does it apply to the Bible classes? And if it applies to the Bible classes, does it cover all of the Bible classes? These things have been discussed and debated. It's in the body. It's in the body politic of our lectures, of our periodicals in the brotherhood. You can, you can pull some out. Your dad has dealt with it. He's, he's been a part of that discussion. And then does it reach into the fellowship events that the church has? Does it cover that? And does it address also individual believers meeting together? In other words, can I forsake you? Is that, is that, is that part of the discussion? Can I forsake you? That's a part of the discussion? So, so, let's say three things about it. Talking about when. We know who, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, my brother, my sister, and me. That's who. When Hebrews 10, 25 addresses it, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner, the habit, the routine, we might even say the lifestyle of some. Here's the first thing. Inspired revelation. That text is inspired revelation. Thank you for leading us in that phrase this morning. We're not reading anything less than inspired revelation when we read Hebrews 10.25. That's inspired of God. That's authorized by God. That's validated by God. God gave him the words. Plenary verbal inspiration. Not just the thought. He gave the words. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So number one, inspired revelation declares that there is a clear line. I want you to follow me in this. A clear line that is crossed in non-attendance that God judges to be outright forsaking. Now, there is a line. When God really analyzes, scrutinizes, judges my participation, there, 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 there is a point, there is a, there is a point in which God says that this is not just about not being present. This is about forsaking. He knows this, this, this is going a bit too far. This is moving into a space that is dangerous, not only to you, but to the body politic. Literally, this word forsaking means to leave behind. Something left behind. I'm here and it's back there. That's the whole idea. I'm not in sync with it. I'm not aligned with it. It also covers to desert. Now we're getting into something. Now, the second thing is that this is a God. Th th there is a God-established 
standard of measuring active attendance or inactive for safety. Churches don't get the right to define that. So just, let's just meet monthly. Let's come together quarterly. Do your thing and just, just remember now, in, 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 we're coming back in, the, in sometime in the quarter. Uh, they don't define that. We're going to see that with great specificity in one of the X passages. God sets the standards. God establishes the criterion. And here it is. Here it is. The slippery slope. I'm sliding. I, I'm, I'm drifting into forsaking the fellowship can become can you receive this in your spirit? According to the text, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, a comfortable and okay to live with bad habit that requires a loving and timely word of exhortation, which is what the Hebrew writer is saying. When do you step in and say that's forsaking? That's abandoning. That's deserting. When do you do that? Well, we seldom do it quantitatively speaking when a person is here this week but gone next week. We seldom do that. But we've got to understand that we're not setting the standards. God is setting the standards. Maybe I'm here as often as the doors are open, but I am dogged determined to do my thing next Lord's Day, not your thing. And maybe you won't come. Well, maybe you'll call me up because I'm supposed to be here doing something on Sunday morning in this space and place. But are we sure about that one time? I'm not being legalistic. I'm not being dogmatic. I'm just raising what is the line of demarcation? Let's not read it, but understanding. And all thy getting, get an understanding. But here's the point, and I think this is a telltale sign. Is when forsaking becomes a comfortable, okay to live with bad habit, they're not comfortable right now. Whether it's the fellowship of the church events, whether it's the worship, whether it's the Bible classes, whether it's the time I'm going to invest in your life, that I'm comfortable not spending time in your life. I, I'm, I'm almost, can I, can I preach it? I'm almost back into a non-believing, non-church stance of not relating to you. I don't hate you. I just don't have to be with you. That's a difference. And God says, that's a bridge too far. Now let's go deeper. God has a predetermined Listen, pre-established a weekly, God did it, not the ecclesia, not the pastors or the elders, the deacons, the bishops, the preacher. No, the church growth committee, the let's love everybody committee. No, they, no, 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 no. They, we came into it. We didn't discover it, but we obeyed it. Being and coming together, requirement of true Christian fellowship. Here it is. On the first day of the week. Notice he comes with the, I wonder why God put it on the first day. Sometimes you got to understand the wisdom of God, the sagacity of God. Not third, not fourth. No, van, van, van. First day. First is first. Foremost. Let's get this thing right on the first day so that your week can be right. So how 
I feel the Spirit of God helping me to understand that. We're trying to get over, what do they call it, Thursday? Get over the hump, Thursday? Get over the hump. And God says, man, I'll tell you how. You don't get over the hump, but you live blessed. Get, get the first day right. Get with the saints. Be with the saints. Come together with the saints. When the disciples came together to break bread. Let's go deeper. Spirit of God, I really need you, honey. I need you to teach this. I, I, I'm too inept. I can't do it. So you, you teach it. You teach it. I'll, I'll vocalize it. But you, you put it. You deliver the mail where it needs to be delivered. The church truthfully, rightly, repetitious and soundly uses this verse to affirm the God-ordained practice of the weekly observance of the Lord's. This is the verse. There are churches who do it. Well, we do the Lord's Supper monthly, quarterly. And we use this verse, my sister. We say, no. So what is the church doing? It's wisely and spiritually discerning the principle of a binding example that establishes a doctrine. When it says on the first day of the week the disciples came together to break bread, that's not doctrine language. That's the language of historical reality. That's what they were doing. How do we move that from historical into doctrine? Well, we understand the principle of a binding example. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. Now, how does that relate? That this historical snapshot affirms the principle, listen, of active Accountable attendance, get this, rather than optional, not required, non binding, discretionary, on and off. See, if you're going to teach me an unbeliever, or somehow I'm caught up into an ecclesia that doesn't really believe in the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper, and you use this verse to teach me, I need to partake of the Supper weekly, you are teaching yourself that you need to attend weekly. When you're teaching me. That's a binding example. My goal is not to legalistically make you feel worse than. No, no, no. But I've already said that there is a line in which I cross over in to being comfortable that needs to be lovingly and truthfully dealt with. That's what the Hebrew writer is doing. Now this text in Acts 7 says that the fellowship with Jesus is commanded and expected. God told Adam and Eve after they sinned, rhetorically, where are you? Why are you not in your God space and place? I'm here. What, 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 where are you? God says to the believer on every Lord's day, I'm going to be here. I'm not going to be AWOL. I'm not going to be too busy. I'm not going to be too caught up into the buying thing. Do you know God is a busy God? <laughs> he's busier than your day planner. He's busier than your schedule. He, he's answering prayers. He's, he's, he's feeding folks, healing people. You know, God is busy all the time. 
But I'm going to be here on the Lord's day, he says. Here it is. If we have fully bought into God's purpose and plan and priority for Christian fellowship, then we will make the investment. I'm talking about getting our fellowship right. Of minutes, hours, days, weeks, and months, and years like you and you and you and you and you. Years you put into this thing. Years. Years into this. Singing, praising. Years. Something Johnny come here lately. You've been here. You've been doing it. You've been investing it. You and 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 you. And God has it written in his book. So what we understand is Acts 2.46. So continuing, there's our word. You remember Acts 20 weekly? Now he's into daily. Something changed. With one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and singleness of heart. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, uh, just bear with me. I, I, I like sometimes to give you a variant translation. And every day they devoted themselves. That's every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from the house the house, the Bible in basic English says, and day by day. The reason why I use this verse is going in agreement. I like that, going in agreement. You don't have to pull me. No, not this week, not this day. Come on, let me go. That's not the idea. You don't have to trick me, man. We got a million dollar check. I'm gonna be there early. Early, man. My name is Jimmy. I'll take all your gimme. And we've got to understand this. This is growth. This is how I advance. This puts a smile on God's face, a frown on the enemy's face, and the way we like it. And so here it is. Here it is. Let's raise some vital questions. How did a daily one another fellowship, this is beyond the weekly worship, become an established practice? Think about that. See, we read it, but how do you get there? How did they get to that point? Must have been some preaching and some obeying. That's just being real. How do you go from weekly to daily? Okay, we're going to start that week. We can go daily to become established practice in the Jerusalem church. So I want to raise these questions. Is some level or type of daily membership connectivity? Let's just raise it, church. Come on. On this first Sunday in April, the year of our Lord, 2024, is that realistic and reachable in busy, fast-paced, always on the go 21st century? That's, that's a legitimate question. And you know, some people say, no. It's not realistic. Really? Think about that. I don't, I don't really have to try to break it down, but think about that. And then what are some short-term and long-term fellowship benefits, Jim, of Church Connect? this bless me in the short term. Church Connect. Not just the system, but the faith-based agreement that we need to be connected. And we are using right now, a hundred years from now, the Lord tarries, maybe something else. But we're using this system right now. How do 
just bless me in the short run? How would it bless me in the long run at Waterbury? I think our pastors can address that with great specificity. Your preachers, gifted teachers. Had a man who came into the building this week. Thank you, Rayanne, bringing him up to the office. Greg Gubatas. I worked on that name. <laughs> can, can I, can I, can I, you know, a little laughter is really good for the better. You know, in my old neighborhood, we, we didn't have to learn Gubatasi. It wasn't many gubatasses, you know. I, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, not many gubatasses. <laughs> Miss Johnsons, Ray Ray, well, I'll leave that one. You know, there are some different names, you know, but gubatas. But he came to the office, and you know what he said? You know what he said? This is what he said. This is what he said into my hearing. He said, "I'm a member of the Episcopal Church." He says, "Where we are, we're, we're on the decline." I'm quoting him. That's his words. And he says, one of the things we've now left out is the, the weekly Bible class. It just, we're holding on, just a few. He says, I need the Bible class. That's gubatasi. That's gubatasi. Who agrees with God. And he was here on Wednesday. Now, Jim, in my customary learning curve, he said, you got Bible class on Wednesday? We sure do. No, we got prayer service. <laughs> but he was in the house, and I texted him to let him know. I am so sorry. I got that mixed up and everything. He said, no. Listen, church. Listen, church. Gubatasi. He says, no. Uh, listen, I can show you the text if you want to. He said, I wish I could just read it. I won't take the time. He says, man, it was good. The warmth and the welcoming. You know what that is? That's koinonia. That's teaching the brother. This is who we about. This is who we are. We don't just hold one finger out and say, you know, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we don't mind embracing. We don't mind Loving you the way God would have us to love you. So why do we live out the fellowship? That's when it affirms our identity and our inclusion. So I'm going to close with this. It expresses an identity that reaches beyond the temporal things of life. Temporal. Not eternal. You also are being built, what? Together, together for a dwelling place. He says, that's what makes Christian fellowship a mark of identity that that when I'm with Todd and Todd's with me, God is building together a dwelling place. When I'm with the brother, when I'm with the sister, when you're with the group, when you're with the assembly, he's building it together. He's building it together. It's the way he wants it. Every time you're in the house, you are being used by God to build together. Every time you are in the Bible class, you are being used of God to build together. Every time you are in the prayer group, you are building together. Every time you are in the missional ministries of this church, count me in, not out, you are building together a dwelling place. You are being used by God to build something bigger than you. That's, that's identity. That's how I identify myself. That's how God says, I know you. You're in the fellowship. You, 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 you're in the fellowship. I know you. But not only that, it's inclusion. 
it continues to remind us that we are a part not the whole but a part a slice of God's family on earth and heaven from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is I like that heaven and earth that's a family of God in heaven we're going to talk about that sister that sister and I we want to study about the second heaven the third heavens and all these different heavens she wants us to talk about it the new heaven and earth his name let's close Part three, we're going to look at what we say and do to get our fellowship right. Seven essential things we're going to have to agree on. That's part three. That's seven things we're going to agree on if we're going to be in the fellowship. Seven things we've got. It's the test of our fellowship. Those seven ones, that's where we're going. It's the test of our fellowship. Church, I'll tell you something. Eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. Eschatology, that's a Bible word. Eschatology, you know the word, Paul. Thank you for your study this morning. That's a good study. We're so blessed to have you and your giftedness into the language. But eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. If you study the doctrine of the last things, one of the things is some will fall away from the faith or the fellowship. That's, that's, that's doctrine of the last thing. And there's nothing you can do to override that. God said it's going to happen. But you can say, not me. Not, not in that number. I don't want to be in that group. But here's the point as we close. My beloved brother comes back. Have you ever thought about eschatology and church growth? Doctrine of last things and church. Let me bring it together. In Revelation 20, it speaks about the devil being loose from his prison. He was bound on the cross. And there is a little season. This is next, uh, Revelation 20, that he shall be loose and go to make war with the saints. We don't teach this enough. One day, uh, maybe I can teach eschatology. This little season. Uh, we may be in the little season right now. That little season before. Oh, Hades is breaking loose, man. Well, the devil is loosed. And the point I want to really go out on a limb. Come on, I, I, I'm closing. Could it be that the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now. Could it be pastors, deacons? That as we get closer to the last day, that God who grows the church, I wish, oh, come on, Spirit, I need you. I need you. I'm going to get myself in trouble. I need you, Lord. Could it be that he's going to become less interested in churches that are not serious about fellowship to grow those churches? Could it be? Because we're getting closer. We're getting closer to the end. And I just want to just pull a pews. I don't want to bring people into, into an assembly that many people are not even there. I don't want to bring people into an assembly that many people say, I really don't need one there. You know, I can take him or leave him. Illustration. Could it be that in the last days of this millennia that he's going to say, I will not grow those congregations. It's a different season. But could it be that those churches that are into Church Connect, praying together, meeting together, studying together, growing together, now that's who I'm going to grow. Could it be? Eschatology. If we get our fellowship right, we'll get our growth right. Our brother's going to come back and lead us in this invitation. I hear and believe God's word of salvation in Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God's right. I'm wrong. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand.
I publicly proclaim Jesus to be God's son. We're putting it into the airways because we want folks to see it when they're, when they're reading and hitting our site. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And I come to be baptized, be baptized and wash away your sins. Not before, but at the time of your baptism. So as our brother comes and leads us into this invitation, the invitation is yours to come right now.